Similar to our case of cough, which was more of an upper respiratory symptom, is dyspnea, or shortness of breath, more of a lower respiratory symptom. Using our mnemonic to help guide us, we'll note the onset, or when did it start. For the duration, we want to know is the shortness of breath constant throughout the day, or intermittent, occurring with certain activities, such as sports or lying down, as we'll see below in congestive heart failure. If it is intermittent, we'd like to note the frequency. How long does an episode last for, and how many episodes are you having per day or per week? And finally, we can note the progression. Does the shortness of breath appear to be occurring more frequently? To help characterize the shortness of breath, since this is a poem case, we can ask now or later in our review of symptoms about any other associated URI symptoms, such as a cough or runny nose. For both, we'll use our mnemonic A, B, and C to write down for our note the amount, blood, and color of any bodily fluid, aggravating and alleviating factors, treatments tried, and any limits on activities. We'll divide our dyspnea case into traumatic, atraumatic, and pregnant etiologies. For all cases, we should order a CBC, serum electrolytes, pulse oximetry, and a chest x-ray. For both pneumo and hemothorax, our supporting points will include shortness of breath, chest pain that can be aggravated by movement or deep breathing, and a history of trauma. We'll add in a fast exam. We'll further divide our atraumatic causes into dry and wet cough, dry being no or clear sputum, and a wet cough having a white or productive sputum or with hemoptysis. In congestive heart failure, we can see the shortness of breath with a dry cough and it can be aggravated by lying down or orthopnea or at night nocturnal dyspnea and our patient can have a history of hypertension, diabetes or an MI. We'll add a BMP, EKG and echocardiogram. In pneumoconiosis, we'll see shortness of breath, a dry cough and a history of an occupational exposure such as a minor. We'll order a CT chest. In asthma, our supporting points can include shortness of breath, dry cough, aggravated at night because there is a circadian pattern to lung function, or the cold air. And our patient can note a history of triggers, such as allergens, either mold or dust mites, or a recent URI. We'll order a peak expiratory flow. And the treatment for an asthma flare includes steroids. In pneumonia, our supporting points will include shortness of breath, a productive cough, a new fever, and as we'll see in our physical exam coming up, the special tests of positive tactile fremitus and egophony. We'll order a sputum gram stain and culture. In chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that includes both chronic bronchitis and emphysema, we can have COPD as a new diagnosis, or if our patient was previously diagnosed with COPD, our diagnosis will be a COPD exacerbation. In both cases, we can have a productive cough and shortness of breath. It will be increased from baseline if in an exacerbation. The productive cough for chronic bronchitis is typically defined for greater than three months for two years. Our patient will also be greater than 50 years old and have be a history of a heavy smoker. We'll order a PFT, and the treatment for a COPD exacerbation includes antibiotics, such as a ZPAC. In lung cancer, we'll see shortness of breath, a productive cough, and hemoptysis, along with the characteristic cancer findings of a weight loss or decrease in appetite. Our patient will also be a smoker, greater than 50 years old, with a possible family history. We'll order a CT chest, bronchoscopy, and lung biopsy. In pulmonary TB, we'll see shortness of breath, productive cough, new onset night sweats, and weight loss, a fever, and a history of travel such as to Africa or an occupational exposure such as working in a jail or in a hospital. We'll order a sputum acid fast smear and a PPD. In pulmonary embolism, we can see shortness of breath with a productive cough, pleuritic chest pain, calf pain, erythema, warmth, and swelling, and a history of oral contraceptives or immobilization, and as we'll see in our physical exam coming up, a positive Hamann sign. We'll add a D-dimer and CT angiography. And finally, in peripartum cardiomyopathy, we can see shortness of breath, and that could be from the final month of pregnancy up to five months postpartum, and we'll include an echocardiogram. Right, we'll start the poem exam with hand sanitizer, and we want to ask our SP if we have our permission to examine you. Okay, after he said yes, we'll start with the hint exam. For the eyes, we're primarily concerned for conjunctivitis. 
for a URI. So we'll ask the patient to look up. So we verbalize there's no conjunctivitis, no parlor, ask them to look down and verbalize no scleral icterus, no conjunctivitis as well. And then we could also quickly assess the nose to see if there's any rhinorrhea, if he has any runny nose or, con or congestion. And you know, we don't see it. And then we could go ahead and look into his oral pharynx. So we could do that with the tongue depressor. And we want to uh, use very light pressure for these SPs. We don't want to uh, cause them any pain. So ask them to stick out their tongue and say, ah. And we'll look around and say that there's no visible lesions. Uh, the oropharynx is clear of exudate. Onto lymphadenopathy. So we're going to go ahead and inspect his cervical lymphadenopathy. So we'll start over here. Next, we're going to go ahead and do submandibular, submental. OK, we're going to do preauricular and postauricular. Do occipital. And we want to do supraclavicular, so please shrug your shoulders. Okay, good. Okay, so we had no lymphadenopathy. We'll go ahead and look at his fingernails, and you don't see any cyanosis. And we could press on his fingers, and we don't see any delayed cap refill. We also want to check for uh, calf tenderness if we were concerned about a PE. So we could squeeze his calves and ask him if he has any pain. Okay, and we're going to introduce a Hammond's maneuver. So it's when you ask him to dorsiflex, please. Please uh, raise up. Uh, We'll raise up your toes, okay. and then we'll squeeze their calf, and we'll ask them if they have any pain. Please raise up your toes again, and then do you have any pain on your calf? Okay. And now once we're, we're finished down there, it's always a good idea to hand sanitize again. So now we can move on to the palm exam. And so for the palm exam, the best way to do this is to drop down the gown halfway and ask the patient to please uh, sit cross, cross your arms here, and this will hold the gown and keep them uh, protected. So the first thing we want to do is uh, verbalize that there's no visible lesions to the anterior chest, to the posterior chest. Next, we'll palpate. So we'll palpate his chest and just ask him if you have any tenderness there or pain. Tenderness or pain. Do the same thing on the back. We could percuss. So we're going to go left to right. Three spots. Listen to his uh, lung fields. We'll use the bell of the stethoscope for his above the clavicle. So we'll instruct you on instruct them every time you feel the stethoscope. Please take a breath in and out. Okay, that was a good equal breath. Now on the other side. So please breathe in and out. And you'll notice here that this time you don't notice a breath coming in and out of him. Instead, you'll just notice an uh, arm shrug. So please do that again. You can see it again over there. So as we Move on to the diaphragm now for his lower lung fields. Please. Okay. And again, we don't hear a breath, and instead we see the sh arm shrug. I'll go ahead and do that for the last lung field. Please. Okay. Good. So that was a good breath. And we see the same thing as well. And now on the posterior side, we'll do the same thing. We'll listen in three spots, comparing left to right. So please. You see the arm move up and down again, and we don't hear a breath. On the right side, we hear a breath. The left. see the arm move. Okay. So now that we completed the uh, auscultation part, we can make a comment that we heard clear breast sounds on the right, but on the left, we didn't hear the breast sounds. We want to go to tactile fremitus. And so the way to do tactile fremitus is to position your arms, your fingers around his uh, scapula and ask him to please say 99. 99. 99. And you could, if you could hear him, it's a little Horse. So that indicates that there's increased tactile fremitus. And now we're going to demonstrate egophony. So for egophony, you could use a diaphragm with a stethoscope. And you'll ask him to please say E. e. Okay, so we heard a clear E there. E. And now we could hear a transition to an A on the left side. We'll do the same thing for the lower lung fields. You hear a good E, e. and an A. E. E. Okay, good. While we have him sitting up here, we want to use economy and movement to make use of the time and listen to his heart sounds. So the mnemonic we're going to use is apartment M225A. So we'll start off with his aortic in the second intercostal space on the right. Go ahead to this pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral. And if this was a female patient, you could ask them to please lift up your left breast. comment that we heard an audible S1, S2, no audible S3s or S4s or murmurs, rows and gallops.